said, no coincidences, having just seen your class, it was just meant to be. Yeah. So let me give you an introduction to, into Miranda. Uh, she's, uh, I think you can tell, a British homeopath, but she's been living in the United States uh, since 1994. And I'm sure she, you know, was anticipating this lovely roller coaster <laughs> of uh, <laughs> moving to the States. Yeah. Um, she's a fellow, yeah. I was. <laughs> <No. laughs> Well, it was this or Boris Johnson. Take your pick. I don't know. Yeah, really. <laughs> she's a fellow of the Society of Homeopaths in the UK, and she's a past president of the North American Society of Homeopaths, which is a nice overlap with me because I'm actually the binational board member of uh, NASH. She has been practicing classical homeopathy since 1982 and speaking about uh, and teaching homeopathy around the world since 1988. So you're clearly in very capable hands today. Miranda's background is in acupuncture, iridology, healing, supervision, and humanistic psychotherapy. And she is currently, if that's not enough, pursuing a master's degree studying the therapeutic relationship. She came to homeopathy, as many of you have, when her son Daniel was a year old and he came down with whooping cough. Uh, she was eventually able to find a good homeopath who fixed the cough and Daniel's overall health. And I think a lot of you have seen that even though we're trying to target a specific illness, the person's overall well-being and sense of health improves as well, which is the best side effect any medicine could ever have. Um, Miranda is a perfect fit for For Homeopathy Canada audience because she believes passionately that homeopathy is medicine for the people. And to that end, her books have made classical homeopathy spectacularly accessible to the layperson, giving people the tools to accurately and safely select healing remedies for themselves and their families, which is what we at 4H Canada are all about. Uh, she's the author of the best-selling The Complete Homeopathy Handbook with a whopping 500,000 copies sold. I've never heard a homeopathy book sold that much. And by the way, Miranda, your website says 250,000. So I got updated. I just, I, it's funny. Thank you. You're fact-checking. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> just so people can be even more impressed with the real 500,000 it's just unheard of in it's been office. selling it's a new classic that's what St. Martin's Press tell me and it's been selling steadily since 1988 so it's not it's you know it's old now like me <laughs> <laughs> But you know, that's the beauty of homeopathy. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. No, you're not old yet. But the, but homeopathy, I mean, that's the beauty of homeopathy, that it's not like, you know, uh, other medicines where they develop drugs and then they have to take them off the market or they change their concept or they find new organs in the body. That's happened twice in the last few years. Yes, it has. Yeah. Homeopathy is steady. So it doesn't matter how old your book is, it still has complete and utter validity. Yeah. It's still... It has mostly stood the test of time. I would, I would revise it a bit if I could. I would. There are a few. Well, we'll look forward to another edition. Maybe you never know. Maybe that will be my project for the year after next. <laughs> <laughs> Relevant to today's class, she's also the author of the much-loved Homeopathy for Mother and Baby, which is called Homeopathy for Pregnancy, Birth, and Your Baby's First Years in the, uh, in the United States. And that is the subject of our book club that is coming up, and we'll talk about that at the end. And she's also the author of A Homeopathic, homeopathic Guide to Stress. So uh, Brandon now lives in Gainesville, Florida. She just told me that she loves humidity, so she is very happy there by way of New Mexico and Seattle since 2006, and where she's practicing, writing, teaching, developing healing creams and practice management software for homeopaths and planting an edible subtropical garden. You can find her at mirandacastro.com. So very easy. I would encourage you to go to her website, noodle around and maybe purchase a few products. So I'll end with a quote from Miranda, and then I, uh, she will take it away. The joy of homeopathy is that learning is a lifelong process. Teaching allows me the pleasure of sharing that process with others on that path. So far be it for me to deprive you of sharing that pleasure, Miranda. So with no further ado, I present to you Miranda Castor. Hey, Robin, thank you. Wow, that was lovely. That was... I've never heard myself quoted before. That was a new experience. I enjoyed it. 
That was a good quote. <laughs> okay, I'm going to minimize that window. So welcome, everybody. Robin already told you all this, and she told you all this. The pregnancy book is my best baby. I'm most proud of that. This is my bestseller, but I love this book. It's sort of a hand holder. If you know someone who's pregnant, you know, even if they don't use the homeopathic part of it, it's jam-packed with solutions for ordinary everyday thinking things through. Um, <clears throat> no judgments, just a clear, you really, I wrote the book I wish I'd had when I was pregnant, of course. And the stress book, this is etiology transposed for the home lay, you know, the home prescriber, the lay person. So it's, we look at stress differently to anyone else. It isn't just emotional and it isn't all bad. And a little tiny bit more about me. This is Daniel, age two. He was a, a thoughtful person. He still is. And um, he's 42 now. <laughs> and he has children of his own. It's kind of remarkable how time, you know, has passed so much time. I grew up with homeopathy. My homeopathic doctor growing up with a, was a naturopath and osteopath. And he used cell salts and herbs and some basic homeopathic medicines when we were sick. And as Robin said, as a mother, I've used basically homeopathy. When I left home at 16, I bought a first aid kit, a couple of books. Actually, I bought two kits, a cell salt kit and a 36 remedy kit from Ainsworth's. They're the pharmacy that supply the royal family with their homeopathic remedies. So. <clears throat> and I still have those kits and they still work. So that's a, a joy of homeopathy is that it's affordable. It lasts forever. The bottle, they have, I don't know if this is true in Canada and America, they have to put an exp expiration date, but that's for the sake of the inert ingredients. It's not the remedies themselves carry on working. Um, so for those of you that are completely new, I've just got a few slides, a few um, little, what is homeopathy? It's a system of energy medicine. It's so elegant. It's so, I can teach you to help yourself. As a practitioner, that's almost, that's possible with herbal medicine a little bit, but um, thera therapies like acupuncture, you have to keep going back to the practitioner. Um, and so I love this aspect of homeopathy is the um, put the power in the hands of the people. Is just and so the more you know, the more you can do. And eventually, if you do it well, you will be compelled to train as a homeopath. That's how we all start. We go, hang on a sec. What is this beautiful thing that just happened with Arnica for a hematoma? Or in my case, it was um, Pertussin and then Serinum. These are funny little remedies for those of you in the... Um, on the webinar who know about the remedies for Daniel's whooping cough and he leapt back into the land of health and some and I said okay after four homeopaths failed to help him the classical homeopath did the business and I said I want that that is good um so they act, they don't do it they don't heal you that's not how they work. They stimulate the body to heal itself. They act as catalysts for healing. And that, that is a fundamental core issue with homeopathy that you have to keep coming back to and reminding yourself, remembering, oh yes, when a remedy doesn't work, I didn't quite, I didn't, you know, I was, it's like when Arnica doesn't work, it's because you have selected it on one symptom, maybe not a very good symptom. And there's a better remedy there. 
you just have to look a little harder to find it. Um, it gro it's growing very fast everywhere, mainly over the counter in America. And in, uh, I'm not so sure in England right now, because it's been under attack um, by the skeptics um, who can't explain it and therefore think it's hooey. In this country, the homeopathic medicines are deemed safe and they're FDA approved, and they're also affordable and sustainable. They're not using up the planet's resources like a lot of medicines. It's a complete healing system that treats acute complaints, you know, like coughs, colds, flus, injuries and chronic diseases. It treats every level, physical, mental, emotional, and it treats all living beings, including plants. There are farmers now who are experimenting with homeopathy in agriculture. Also, it's very popular in England for farmers, for dairy farms. They've, <clears throat> the farmers who use homeopathy for mastitis have been able to avoid antibiotics. Our principles, they're coherent, they make sense, and they're applicable even in an acute situation. We treat like with like. This means that when you cut, that's what, what is the onion doing here? <laughs> when you cut an onion, it makes your eyes water. Some people water more than others. It makes can make some people's noses water as well. And it's clear, typically, it's a clear fluid, stream, stream, stream. What do these symptoms remind you of? They remind you of, I know, a common cold. Yeah, particular type of common cold, one that comes on suddenly, stream, 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 or, hmm, also hay fever. Yes, seasonal allergies. So the homeopath uses this substance as a homeopathic remedy for people with the symptoms that it causes in a healthy person. And that's what we mean by treating like with like. Minimum dose means we dilute it to make it more potent, more tar carefully targets the symptoms more directly, more strongly. We just give one remedy at a time. We take the whole person into account. So if you're common cold, you've got streaming eyes and nose, and you're sneezing a lot and you're very irritable, it's not the little onion remedy, it's another one. So the whole picture is very important. Onion, which we call allium sepa, that will help a little bit, but not that much. We, um, susceptibility is important to us, not with home prescribers so much as with chronic complaints, we look at inherited weaknesses. Also, life experiences, including illnesses that have weakened someone's general health and vitality to the point that they've become more susceptible. I mean, it's happening with COVID. Some people are getting it and some aren't. And this isn't all about viral load. Some of it is about um, the immune system, the health of the immune system. And so the vital force is the energizing principle of a person. You can call it chi or prana, depending on, you know, other systems. Used. I mean, it's our ener the energetic life force. And this is what we believe is the healing principle within us all. So the minimum dose, our remedies are made in a laboratory <laughs> and sometimes people who are new to me, they pick up a bottle and they say, you know, like, what is this? Well, um, it starts with the tincture. So that's alcohol mixed with a plant or other substance and added, one part of it is added to nine parts of water and alcohol, and then it's shaken vigorously. We call the shaking succussions, and the resultant remedy is a one X. One part, one mil is taken and added to 99 parts of water and alcohol, 
shaken vigorously, that becomes a 2x. So this is what the numbers after a remedy, the, the name of the remedy mean on the bottle. The number of times they've been diluted and shaken vigorously. And we, homeopaths, um, you can test this out by diluting without shaking. That there comes a point where nothing happens. The substance is lost. There's no healing effect, no effect whatsoever. The shaking is the key to success in homeopathic manufacturing processes. And these are what the numbers mean. Um, the, the decimal scale, which is one in 10, has an X after it. So a 24 X has been diluted 24 times and so on. The centesimal scale has been diluted one in a hundred. One part of the herb, the macerated herb, to 99 parts of water and alcohol, shaken vigorously and then repeated and repeated. Um, and as Robin told you, the Annika she gave to her um, friend's husband or husband's friend, I've forgotten which, the, you know, had been diluted um, 10,000 times. Of course, this is carried out by machines. Um, and the pharmacists who make 200C, which is a high potency in homeopathy, you tend not to get those over the counter. The pharmacists that make these by hand take um, a week to um, run up one remedy to a 200C that's shaken vigorous, big 30 times and that process is repeated 200 times. So you'll see here, aconite 6, 6C, been diluted six times, one in 100. This one, chamomilla 6X, has been diluted one in 10, six times, and so on. And just for those of you that have a scientific background, Avogadro's number means that the point at which there is nothing of the original substance at a molecular level, this is reached tw at 12C. So everything above 12C at a molecular level has nothing in it. It's thought now that homeopathic medicines are basically nanoparticles, but we, or submolecular, but we have not, we do not have um, the kind of machinery or, you know, that can measure it. So we're just guessing. Um, here's some remedy notes, just for f just FYI. Our medicines are tested on humans, generally not sick people, healthy people, relatively healthy, to find out how they would make you sick. We take a remedy, usually they're blinded, we don't know what we're taking, take it for, you know, a, until we start to develop symptoms and write those symptoms down in meticulous detail. Though that information is um, collated across a group of people testing or proving as it's called, testing the same remedy. And these notes are then used in a clinical situation to verify their effect on patients presenting with similar symptom profiles. Then they go into the books. It's a very, it's in theory, it's a repeatable process. So we th think of it as scientific. Um, and our remedies are made from a wide range of sources, plants, minerals, metals. Here are some of the um, substances, remedies I'm gonna teach today. Belladonna, deadly nightshade. Not all our substances are cute little plants. Calendula, marigold definitely is cute. Annika Montana grows high up in the Alps. Arsenic, not so cute. Um, calcarea, carbonicum, which is from oyster shell, sort of, again, from the animal kingdom, fish kingdom, <laughs> the ocean. Silica, which is from flint. Chamomilla, 
gelsemium, which is, um, you know, um, it's the uh, sempervirens. It's the um, vine that falls all over where I live. I've forgotten its common name. Hypericum, which is St. John's wort and pastilla, cute little pastilla. So some of our substances are cute. Some of them look cute like deadly nightshade, but are not cute at all. You will die if you ingest the berries. Children do all the time, it's terrible. Um, and we've got thousands and thousands of these remedies in the pharmacies, but typically only use, you know, three, four, 500 on a regular basis. They're non-toxic. There are no side effects when they're used properly. They're affordable, I said that already, and eco-friendly, I mean, they one vial of a remedy. Let me just go back to this. This is how the remedies are medicated. Um, the carrier is a sucrose or a saccharum lactose pillule or tablet and a few drops of the medicating potency are dropped in, the bottle shaken, and it's left to dry. There's no way, there's hardly any waste. There's a bit of water and alcohol poured off, obviously, but hardly any waste. And we don't care that there's no explanation. Homeopathy, <laughs> we've just said, we don't care, it works. Um, and uh, unfortunately, if people are new to homeopathy, they try it and it doesn't work, they say homeopathy doesn't work. But I mean, our patients are mostly happy and so are we. So they come to us when uh, conventional medicine has failed them and um, they see improvements where they were failing before and there are every homeopath has hundreds of similar cases. So uh, our outcomes research looks good. I've got a slide at the end with links to um, the best research sites. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about 17 remedies. This is a small selection. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some common complaints in children to get you started, because there's no way I can teach you everything in an hour or so. But this, I'm hoping that this will get you juiced up and excited about using some of these, one of these remedies for your kid, for, you, you know, a kid in your life, for a loved one. So. And I've got little mnemonics, if you like. I'm teaching them in groups so we can compare as we go. So ABC for fevers, ACH for injuries, BHE for flus, CS for colds, PP for colds and coughs, and IS for emotional stress. Then I've got a couple of cell salts I'm not teaching all about everything, just a couple of my favorite home users, cell souls. So if you haven't, <laughs> if you have had a look at a you know book like mine and you see these long lists of symptoms, data if you like, it can be challenging to sift through it. There's a point where they all look similar or the same. They merge, the remedy descriptions merge into one another. But you know what, this is an illusion. Yes, there's overlap. But the difference is a key. Each remedy stands alone and we have to somehow learn that and that learning process might be different for you than me. But we have to find a way to do it so that we're not reinventing the wheel each time we try and find a remedy. So my suggestion, start by noticing, sim make lists, you know, two, three similar remedies. Notice similarities, list differences, list um, key things that jump out at you that you've seen yourself in someone who needed that remedy. Just anything that will act as a hook, a memory hook for you. And I like to think of 
these remedies as friends. I urge you to think of them as friends, maybe that you haven't met yet, new friends. Because when you meet one and it works for you, it will become memorable, it'll become a best friend. <laughs> Annika is everybody's best friend once they've used it. Um, and unforgettable at that point, like a good friend. So we're going to start with fevers ABC for fevers and earaches. And um, these are the first three remedies you'll think of with a high fever with pain. What is the pain? What kind of pain and what kind of fever? So aconite and belladonna both have sudden onset of violent symptoms. <clears throat> they're, they're, both, they're so similar that they're fairly hard to tell apart. Um, aconite comes after a shock or getting chilled. And typically, this differs from belladonna, typically aconite, a child who needs it, will go to bed, okay, they're, they're not sick yet. They may be a bit tired where they wouldn't be normally, um, or they're whiny, you know, they're not, quite themselves, they go to sleep okay, then they wake up around midnight or in the early hours of the morning with the fever, with symptoms, with screaming, with earache, um, with a cough, with a cold, with croup. It comes on suddenly, they went to bed okay, they wake around midnight. Belladonna, it can happen at any time, maybe the afternoon, <laughs> maybe when they wake, it doesn't, it's not notable. So that's a big difference between these two. Aconite is the remedy you give in the first 24 hours of an acute illness. Boom, just knocks it on the head. If it comes on suddenly. Doesn't have to come around midnight. That's why it's not highlighted. Has to come on suddenly. So they can, you know, we got winter, you got winter. I've got win winter coming. Of course, winter in Florida is like 70 degrees in the day, 50 at night. You know, we, we whine and cry a little bit at 50 when it goes below 60 with such babies here. Um, but um, so we're talking about a real chill. You get chilled to the bone and you're vulnerable. Um, it doesn't have to be around midnight, but as long as that symptom is there. Um, with um, belladonna, the cause is often get, they get drenched in the rain. They get, a kid gets wet at the cold, you know, when they're in the ocean, they don't want to get out, but they get cold and their teeth are chattering, but they're having so much fun, they won't get out. Next day, they're sick. This is um, if, if it didn't come on like an aconite or you gave aconite and it didn't do anything, you're looking now at belladonna. They both have high fevers. With belladonna, it's got a particular type of fever. There's no sweat at all. The person radiates heat. They're like a radiator. They like, you put your hand next to their body and the heat radiates off of them. They're red. The face is red. The pupils are dilated and sparkling. They're like, um, and they're chattering, chattering, chattering. It's a kind of delirium with the fever and restless. They're both restless. They both toss and turn. Aconite is not delirious. They are scared. They are, you look into their eyes and you feel the fear. It's a terrible kind of this. Mom, <laughs> I'm going to die. Tell me I'm not going. Mom, tell me I'm not going to die. Your child, the child will say that, and the mother in you will go, mm, darling, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. I promise you'll be okay. It's just a little fever. Come on, let me. So you're comforting them, and you have to, somewhere in your brain, you have to say, Miranda said this might happen and when it does I have to remember that the words mean something. 
The words are so important when a child or a grown up says, I feel like I'm dying. Don't be, be a homeopath, be a homeopathic, a homeoholic, as I say, be somewhere in your being. Notice that, say, oh, how silly that they said that. Yes, but they're asking for aconite. That's what that means. So um, crazy as it is, it happens so often. We see it so often with children and grown-ups with an acute illness that comes on suddenly after a shock or getting chilled, or, you know, that they feel like they're dying and say so. Of course they're not. And you give aconite and that's the end of it. They leap back into the land of health. People who need this have an unquenchable thirst. People who need belladonna have no thirst. So there's sort of very beautiful, clear differences. You should not give <laughs> aconite to a thirsty person, ideally, unless it's around midnight, they've woke up with a high fever after getting chilled or a shock the day before, and you say, I'm, even though they're not drinking, I, it, this is so strong, it overrules everything. It overrules the differences. So you are weighing up each time you give a remedy. It's never going to be perfect. You're never going to have every symptom. And sometimes, one memorable time, Daniel got um, septicemia. And he had every single symptom in, the Bella, in this list every single one and it didn't work so there will be times when that happens because there was one piece of information i didn't know yet and i've written about this i'll i will give a link in my handout to um you know he you know this was a it will happen and you'll learn from it. I learned from it and I wrote everything that I learned in this little article. Um, people who need aconite are better for fresh air and worse in a stuffy room. That's all they like, open the window, please, mum. Or, you know, so now the third remedy in this trio is chamomilla. They have a high fever, they have earache, it's bad. They wake up at night, worse at night, with terrible pains, with colic, with teething or whatever. Um, you know, these big remedies can have any symptom, any physical symptom. We care less about the physical symptom than we do about these general, what caused, what is causing the pain. Um, how someone is uh, manifesting that their symptoms in general, whether they're hot or cold, thirsty or not. And with chamomilla, they're restless. So there we have another similar, these three are all restless. They all have violent pains. With chamomilla though, they are the worst. They're worse than belladonna probably, they're unbearable. The child is screaming his head off or her head off and cannot be comforted. They want to be picked up and carried. The minute you do, they're writhing and wriggling, want to be put down or ask for something like a drink or something to eat and then literally throw it down. They're, um, they're in a very bad way. Um, they have, they're having tantrums because of the pains. And um, if they're teething or they've got earache even, they have red cheeks, both cheeks, or red patches, little round red patches on both cheeks or one. If it's teething, they'll have a red patch on the side that they're teething. So, there we have uh, the little ABC for fevers and earaches. <laughs> now, there are other remedies for these complaints. And you can now start pinning those other remedies onto this little trio. You can start expanding your knowledge as you, as you understand and use the remedies. Miranda? 
Yes. Question for you. Yes. Because this is something that's going to happen so often for people at home with their themselves yes. too. It's not just advice for children. This is the same thing for adults as well. Yes. Can you help people to understand? They'll often have a few potencies at home. And can you help them to understand when, let's say, 30 would be appropriate or six or 200 for these situations? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to talk about potencies um, after I've talked about the remedies. Um, you know, if you don't have different potencies, the best potency is the one that you have at hand. Whatever you've got is the best potency. Doesn't matter what it is. The most important thing is the remedy after that. Potency does, it, it, it matters a bit, but not that much. Um, rule of thumb, the more severe the symptoms, the more severe the illness, the higher the potency. The, sorry, I missed out something. Let me say that again. The more severe the illness, the, the more sure you are in the remedy, the more, more symptoms you have for one remedy, the higher the potency. If you're not sure of the remedy, go lower. You'll soon find out. If it's a mild illness, go lower. I, I always counsel people to try the low potencies, see what they can do, experience how brilliant they are. My personal favorite potency in the whole world is, wait for it, 12C. 12C. You can't get it so easily. I used to order from the English pharmacies and you could get whatever potency you wanted. And 12C is like strong, but not too strong. You can repeat it without getting into trouble. It will really do great work. So, but six is great, 30 is good. They're all good. 200, if you've got a 200C kit and you don't have training, I would be cautious with it. It's, it can be quite, um, um, it can be a little bit rough if it's not the exact right remedy. Okay. Injuries. Um, so these ACH, these three are your top three remedies for getting to learn all about how homeopathy can help with um, common injuries, bruises, bumps, you know, falls onto the head, babies, you know, every baby gets dropped on the head once. I don't know why. Every, every mother has a tale to tell. Um, you need arnica in the house and what you have to do <laughs> is you have to wait until you know, if it's a fall on the head, wait until there's a, a lump, you know, a little swelling, wait until, or an arm, wait until it's come up, but hasn't discolored. Wait, and then you give a single, just a, a pellet, one dose of the Arnica at that point before the discoloration has started. And in front of your eyes, that swelling will go down. It, it is... Once you've seen that, you say, oh, there is something in this. Well, I don't mind what it is because it just <laughs> was helped, you know, heal my little one. So Arnica is basically injuries to soft tissues, muscles, these, you know, it's not so good and to the head, which isn't soft, frankly. But um, it, these two, are the main, it's swelling after injury with bruising. And the part feels sore and bruised. Typically, people who need Annika constitutionally, where it'll work really like a charm, are worse for touch. They do not want you going anywhere near them or their injury. These are people who get up out of a car accident and say, or, you know, if they've been knocked off their bicycle, they'll jump up and say, I'm fine. I just want to go home. And if you're a nurse or you have background in first aid, you know not to let them. If you saw them bang their heads, you, they mustn't. They, they got to go and get evaluated. Um, but they, 
say I'm okay after a shock, it's notable. Sometimes people get ill with a flu or even a cold or a cough and they do this, they say the same things. I'm okay, actually. It was, um, it has been a keynote for COVID-19 that people in the beginning of the disease say, I'm fine, I'm going to be fine, don't worry about me. I saw that repeatedly, it was very striking to me. So I didn't give Arnica, but because there are other remedies that say that, that have flu-like symptoms, but because um, I didn't have any confirmation, any of these other symptoms to go with it. But we got to listen to the words people use when they're sick and not discount them, is my point. And um, the bed feels hard. They'll say, I had one patient turn her mattress over when she had the flu. <laughs> she, she was convinced there was her mattress, there was something wrong with it. And um, she was that sick. Um, I mean, she could hardly move, but she turned her mattress over to get it a softer feel. It didn't work, of course, but she got Arnica and that helped the flu symptoms. Okay, um, calendula. Um, this is clean cuts, injury to the skin, to epithelial tissue, to eyeballs. Calendula is clean cuts, grazes or wounds. So after surgery, it helps the, the skin to knit up, literally. It's very good for like first stage burns or scalds where the pain is out of proportion to the injury. That's the keynote, that's all you've got, a clean cut that's very painful. But it's not like hypericum, an injury to a nerve rich part, a crushing injury to a finger, toe, puncture wounds, severe, you know, injuries to nerves, typically they shoot up a limb, um, you know, um, up the leg. Um, also, you can get um, injuries around the mouth, which are full of nerves to the spine. If you've had a bad fall on your coccyx, you can get um, pains that shoot up the spine. That is very bad. Hypericum is your friend. Um, I have, I am unusual, I'm not exactly accident prone, but I have more accidents than the average bear. And my accidents are, are always fairly dramatic and, and unusual. Um, and you know, I, I took an axe, you know, I was chopping wood. I chopped the top of my thumb off when I was younger. I mean, it's all, you know, just stuck it back on, <laughs> took a few remedies. <laughs> Hypericum. And then there was the time where I dropped my chef's knife. You know, a chef knife, it, I'm not a chef, but I have a beautiful knife. And it's, they're huge. They're fabulous for cooking with. And, um, I dropped it. I, it, it fell out of my hand and um, went in, you know, pierced my toe. Um, not my big toe, the one next to it was very bad. It took hypericum repeated over a couple of weeks. Every few days I'd have to take another dose to get the, those nerves to heal without residual neurological pains or lack of function, numbness. There are all sorts of symptoms you can get after a bad pain like that. Luckily, I didn't chop it off. Okay, so don't be confused. Here is calendula cream. This, if I get a cut, um, I just take a dollop, you take a dollop, put it on the cut or on the band-aid, put it straight onto the band-aid and wrap it tightly. This, that is, this is the tincture of calendula. It's not really the homeopathic remedy, it's more herbal. And Helios also make hypericum and calendula, this is a 
a British favorite. I don't know which pharmacists in Canada make this, but this is a British favorite for um, cuts that are painful because you've um, touched on a nerve. And um, that is very different from calendula, the homeopathic remedy. This is the one from my first aid kit. Now, you can take the remedy or use the cream. You don't, or you can do both. Um, but um, there are times when I'll do a dry uh, bandage, maybe a scald, and I'll just wrap it quickly and I'll take calendula. There are times when I want to put calendula on and it's not that bad. I Immediately, I feel the pain easing up. I don't need to take anything. But if the pain continues, so use common sense and go one step at a time. Don't throw everything at an injury, everything at the same time. Are there any questions about that, Robin? Uh, I'm only seeing a question about um, fractures right now. Fractures. As in that ACH, that the uh, aconite calendula hypericum, can it be used at the time of fracture as well? This is from Tammy. Thank you for your question, Tammy. Or is there a better remedy or grouping to use? You'd always give ac arnica f f first or, or maybe aconite, this, the remedy for shock. So. I, one of my spectacular injuries, I stepped out in front of a car going 30 miles an hour. Um, they, and they ran over the car, one of the wheels ran over one of my feet. Um, luckily it was on a corner. This is the only explanation I can have for this. Um, it was on a corner. So because he turned, you know, the, the, the inside wheel wasn't, wasn't the full weight of the car. I mean, it was smashed into my um, shin bone and ran over my foot. I mean, it was bad, but I didn't break anything. So you now have to, because I could wait there, I could wiggle my toes. And the person who ran over stopped and took me home. And actually, I didn't know him, but he was the pharmacist at the local hospital. And he was very upset. I just said, this is in England. This happened a while ago. And I said, just, you know, I'll be fine. I'm fine. I heard myself say it. <laughs> and then I got home and I surveyed myself and I was shaking. And I kept saying to myself, you know, I could have died. I nearly died. I mean, I can't believe I'm still alive. I can't believe I'm standing. Oh my God. And I'm shaking from the inside out. It wasn't like um, mild shaking. It was severe. I took one dose of aconite and then I moved on an hour or so later because the swelling started. My foot swelled to twice its size. I took arnica. I did take a turn in every, uh, I forget, quite every half hour, something like that. And um, I had a friend who was an osteopath, like a chiropractor came and did an adjustment. And that was it pretty much. I, I got to wear the beautiful shoes I bought because I was the best woman at my best friend's wedding the next day. And I got to do that. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, um, had I fractured anything, I would have gone on to take the indicated remedy when prepared for fractures here. The indicated remedy for broken bones. Symphytum is your number one remedy. I've written about fractures and I will, I will make sure that that article, the link to that article is in this handout also. Um, Bryonia is a, a wonderful fracture remedy. Hypericum can be important if there's nerve involvement, if the fracture has affected nerves. You know, ankles sometimes when you break bones and, you know, in places that are nerve rich, you can get all kinds of shooting pains that are 
worse for cold. Like, so then you're thinking of other remedies other than symphyton. So let's look at flus now, the top three here for flus. Number one is gelsemium, always. So G-A-B for flus, gab or bag. But I wanted gelsemium to go first. It, you, so um, you will see, oh, Robin, I have a question for you. In America, the FDA has, um, it has um, prescribed, if you like, made the manufacturers put a complaint on the bottle. So um, calendula, the remedy, has skin irritation, even though it's only one of hundreds or thousands of symptoms on um, Arnica, it says headache, stupid. Um, do you have to do that in Canada? Do rem a remedy is sold by name or by name and symptom, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's changing now. I've noticed that, for example, Boiron, which is a big manufacturer, yes. when I look at them um, and the states, when I look like, let's say I go to Amazon.com for the states, I notice that there is an indication on the tube. Yeah. Whereas when I look at it in Canada, there is no indication. Right. But I think slowly, slowly, they're starting to want to impose legislation whereby uh, we have to put some warnings on it or some indications on it. And I know that in Quebec pharmacies, they put up signs next to homeopathic medicines and saying that there is no evidence that this is efficacious whatsoever. So... It's not going in a good direction, but so far we've been spared what's been going on in the States. Yeah, we've got the same problem here in a major way. So um, <clears throat> with gelsemium, I'm going to talk about these two at the same time. You've got gelsemium, the symptoms develop slowly. It's not a sudden onset like aconite and belladonna. Bryonia likewise develops slowly. This is your classic flu. People go to bed, cannot lift their head off the bed because everything is so heavy. Cannot open their eyes because their eyelids are heavy. They sleepy, drowsy, droopy, heavy. That's the, the MO, if you like. With bryonia, everything is achy, just like with gelsemium. Uh, but they are, uh, and they're dry. There's no sweat with gelsemium. So there's a, another correspondence. Um, but gelsemium, they have a very peculiar MO. They are worse for the slightest movement and better for firm pressure. So um, because they don't want to move, they will... Um, they'll go to bed and sleep and stay there if they get a cough. This is really a torture for them because it um, hurts to cough. It, it, coughing involves movement. Coughing makes the headache. Everything hurts and they get incredibly irritable. They want to be, you try and help. If you try and fuss, if you sit on the bed, if you try and make them drink, it's not appreciated. They will bite your head off. They will snap and snarl, we say, call them the bear. They are very thirsty, unlike gelsemium, but you can miss it because drinking involves movement. So they will drink large quantities at infrequent intervals. They'll have you know, a huge glass every, I don't know, two, three, four hours, whatever. Whereas gelsemium are not at all thirsty and they're not sweaty either, just like belladonna. So there's the overlap there. Um, and they get this, you will see this with the fever, low grade fever with the, the flu. They have chill, heat alternating with chill, so they'll get hot, boiling hot, and then, you know, they'll 
they'll get chilled and have to wrap up and the chills will run up and down their spine. It's very unpleasant. Um, a lot of people have seen gelsemium as the main remedy. These three remedies have all been commonly used for people with COVID symptoms or flu symptoms this season. You know, any one of these can be the main one. You just have to keep your eye out for it. Um, arsenicum typically is a gastric flu. They get diarrhea and vomiting. Sometimes if it's really bad, it's at the same time. You know, they're sat on the toilet with a bucket in their lap. It's really costly. And they get absolutely prostrate. They'll lie on the bathroom floor after, but they'll be so chilly. They'll be just beside themselves, you know, if they can't get warm on the floor. They are thirsty, but only for little sips. They take little sips often, sipping, sipping, sipping. Um, if they got headaches or GI pains, they'll typically be burning. And those pains will be better for heat. And that's an unusual symptom. And that is what homeopaths live for. <laughs> we, we live for the unusual symptom because that doesn't just guide us to the remedy. It drags us there and, you know, puts up, a, you know, big lights. <laughs> you know, it's like an arrows. <laughs> It, it confirms it. If you have burning pains or your child does um, that are better for hot drinks or better for a hot compress, that's unusual. Normally burning pains are better for cold. So when they're better for heat, only a small proportion of people have that. Um, and uh, people, we can add this to arsenicum. They're typically restless because they're anxious and irritable. They're worried about things. And older people, not typically with children, but a, a grown-up will want the room to be tidy. It's um, sort of an unusual. Uh, and they'll say, I don't like the mess here. Take my, you know, tie, take my cup away or don't leave things so though. They'll be irritable with you if you don't keep the room tidy. <laughs> and you, if you're the husband or the wife or what, you know, the ch child of, and it's your mother who's sick, you'll, you'll, you might get a little bit, you know, <laughs> don't speak to me like that. I'm trying to help you. But again, remember me, remember Miranda in your head saying, oh, this is a symptom. <laughs> This is, they're trying to tell me something. They're trying to tell me they need arsenica. So the, another peculiar symptom with arsenica, we see it a lot. Everything is better for warmth because they're so chilly, except for the headache. So they'll sit bundled up um, with their head out next to an open window or with a cold washcloth on their head. So but they have to be completely, you know, bundled up with duvets and everything to do that. Okay, next. Here, are, I'm going to do two sets of big remedies. These are common remedies in babies, infants and children, toddlers, children of all ages. Um, 50% of children that high need calcarea carbonica, calc or calcarb as it's known at some point. Um, and some children need it repeatedly because that's a remedy, a really good remedy for them because they are generally slow. They're not, um, you know, they don't have developmental delay. It's not that kind of slowness. They're just at the slow end of things, slow to walk. They don't walk till 14 months. They talk two, two years old. Um, they're slow to teeth. You know, at six months, they won't have any. Um, they're, you know, oh, um, I'm, I've got a, 
cat. I'm going, let's. Um, I just have to let my cat in and I just have to hope that she's going to behave. <laughs> she's <laughs> You're reminding me of when I was taping a two hour class. Yes. And I'm trying to do it in one shot. And my cat started scratching on the glass door about an hour and 40 minutes in and there was yes, no way. That's what she was doing. <laughs> but she doesn't just scratch. She, she howl. She will howl. You know, she's 18 years old. So I have to. Oh, here. Yeah, you got it. She's the boss. <laughs> okay. I'll, sh I'll show you her in a minute. Um, so people, the children who need calcarea, they can be slow to get going. I've, um, um, they, but they're easy going. They, these are the easy babies. They sleep well, they eat well, they eat really well. They gain a ton of weight. These are the, until they start walking, these are the, you know, Michelin babies, I like to call them the ones with loads of tires, you know, <laughs> those rolls. And um, they're just lovely, but the mothers, <laughs> when you ask them about their feet, their sweaty feet, whether they have smelly, sweaty feet, or, you know, do their head sweat in their sleep, they, they don't like to admit it, some of them. But some of them will look at me as if I'm like a witch doctor, how did I know that? Um, so, and they typically have sour sweat, more especially when they get sick. Um, when they get sick with a cold or a cough or whatever it is, it doesn't matter, earache, they get swollen glands. And um, they, uh, um, these are just the kids who are easygoing, but know what they want and will crave eggs. And also one other peculiar thing, which is they're the ones that will um, eat dirt or chew on pencils and swallow it or, you know, paper. You know, they, they were the ones that will put everything in their mouth like all children do, but they take it one step further. Um, silica, they're a bit sluggish too, getting going with this walking and talking and everything, but not as slow as calcarea. They're both chilly. They both have sour sweat. Whereas calcarea, kids who need calcarea, the sweat will tend to be more clammy. You know, with silica, it's profuse. They're, as older children, their sweat eats their socks. You know, it's that bad. And um, they both get swollen glands. But the kids that need silica are more wimpy and shy. They just, they, they, they don't have a lot of self-confidence. They know what they think inside, but they, they're shy to share it. Um, they, um, they need a lot of help if they get chilled because they're skinny little things. People who need silica are more slender or even skinny. They don't have great appetites. And if they get chilled or get wet or the weather changes and they get a cough or a cold, it'll go on for a while. And um, if they get a cough or a sore throat, sore throat especially, they will get this unusual symptom where they will feel like there's a hair on the back of their tongue. And children who have that symptom strongly will beg the parent, the mother or the father to get, take it away. There's a hair on my tongue, I get it, I can't get it, take it off. They, you know, <laughs> um, so calcarea doesn't have that symptom at all. Um, it can get people, children who need this remedy will get sick after getting chilled or wet also. So two similar common remedies of childhood. And here are two more 
50% of children need Pulsatilla in their um, children, not children, children, infants, the babies at some point in the first year or two, you can, they will need um, transitioning from breastfeeding or the bottle to, um, you know, solids, they'll get sick. And that'll be a time to think about possibly Pulsatilla. Now, I've put these two remedies together because they're so often confused. They both um, look sweet as babies. They both look um, like they want, you know, affection. But they're very different in their desire for affection. Pe people, the children who need phosphorus they want to take affection. They're very clingy. These are the children who um, are emotional and weepy. They're a bit of a, when they get sick, they're, they're a bit hard work. They're um, mom, they want carrying, the babies want carrying all the time. And they want carrying in the fresh air. If you take them outside, the teething pains, the cough, the earache, what, whatever's wrong, it's better that they stop crying if you take carry them outside. For, for as long as you, if you've got fresh air, because if you live in South Florida, fresh air is not really, you know, for six months of the year, you don't really get it. But um, so people, children, people, infants who need phosphorus, they're affectionate because they're sympathetic by nature and they want to give affection. They're not taking it so much as giving it, but they also want to be um, soothed from their fears. So all children, don't they, go through phases where they're scared of something. Um, many children become scared of the dark. The children that need phosphorus are scared of the dark squared. It's that they cannot sleep without a light. Um, and they get petrified around storms during a storm or the noise, thunderstorm. So that dynamic is very different from Pastilla. And also phosphorus children, very thirsty thirsty for cold drinks, especially ice drinks, especially milk. Whereas postular children, you can't get them to drink. They're completely thirstless. Um, children that need phosphorus have a fast metabolism, like to eat often. They are, and they're the easy bleeders. <laughs> this is the child who has a nosebleed, blows their nose, has a nosebleed. You don't even need all these other symptoms. If they have a nosebleed or they bleed too much after a dental visit, maybe after um, one of their baby, a tooth gets knocked out, a baby tooth, and they bleed after that. Um, a single dose of phosphorus, any potency you've got can be, you know, just magic. Um, both of them get sick after getting wet, after getting chilled, after change of weather. Um, and um, I think that's all I want to say about these two. Emotional stress. Um, these two are, are every, brilliant everyday remedies. Ignatia is soothing the heart. This is for the sad person. Oh, so sad after a loss. It can be a good friend, um, you know, a grandparent, a beloved grandparent for a child or a pet or a dream. They had a, you know, hope and now it's lost, it's gone, it's got dashed, you know, in, an, in a grown up, a job or a loss of a school or, you know, possession, a beloved possession. Sometimes people lose rings that mean something or a teddy bear, 
um, I had one child who went into a hospital and she had an unusual um, disease and her parents, this is a long time ago, 35 years ago, her parents were told to destroy all her soft toys and all her clothes and she was bereft. Um, so um, people who need Ignatia, they cannot, they should cry, it would be good for them, but they can't. If they can, they will want to do it alone. They, they won't want to be comforted because they've got this contradictory impulses going on inside of themselves. So the child, uh, leave me alone, mom. No, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to cry. Don't, you know, they'll just, you know, go into their room, be on their own, be sad in there. If, they, if you do, if you're very good, sympathetic person, and you ask the right questions and they cry, they will sob. They won't just, it won't be little trickly tears, it'll be sobbing. Um, before that time though, when they talk about things, they will be sighing a lot because holding the grief in, the loss, is, is hard work. I mean, it can happen to any of us, can't it? So they do this sighing breath um, and they'll say, it's not hair on the tongue, it's a lump in the throat. Can you feel? I've got something, I, I think I've got a growth <laughs> so when I swallow. It's this, like a lump there. Uh, uh, and is there anything wrong? Ah, is there anything wrong with me? <laughs> they will have, you know, a sense of a weight on the chest. And the contradictory symptoms go through to the physical. They'll somatize the emotional stress. They'll have a cough that is better if they don't cough. So they inhibit the cough, they hold it in, they hold it in, just like the tears. And um, the cough is worse when they cough, they start coughing, they can't stop, they start crying, they can't stop. So there's a gestalt here. Um, and they can get insomnia, they can not be able to sleep, they can get sore throats, headaches, all kinds of complaints after an emotion, a big emotional stressor. You might not think it's big, but it's big to them. It was mattered to them because now they're doing this whole picture and they can't sleep at night for thinking about their friend who's moved away or whatever it is. Okay, califosphoricum. This is a simple tonic, nervous exhaustion. This is a nerve nutrient. It's um, this is a sal salt. I like it best as a low potency, 6X or 6C. And it's a brilliant little, little homeopathic tonic after a period of, you know, studying a lot for a project, for an exam, being, um, you know, just a lot of mental strain or an acute illness. And people are kind of dragging, they're a bit low, you'd say, they were depressed, but they're not really depressed. It's not true depression. It's just a bit low. <laughs> just can't, just dragging about and can't get going. They're worse for cold. They're much better for heat. And they get nervous headaches and insomnia. I mean, it's not, it's, it, it's maddening to now the project is done, the exam's over, the drama, whatever it was, you know, they did a play and that's finished. And now they can sleep, but they can't because they're overwrought, their nervous system's overstressed. Califos will bring it back into balance. And the last two remedies in this little group today, um, are my two favorite cell salts, Calimia and Magnesium Phosphorica, Magphos, Califos. So Calimia is um, nutritive to all the mucous membranes, nose, sinuses, lungs, bronchi. It just like, um, it, it's brilliant for helping with 
the, a cold where you don't stuffy head, stuffy nose, bit of a cough. You don't have strong symptoms yet, maybe, except for a white tongue. The tongue is coated white or the snotty nose is a bit white. It's not gone yellow yet. So an uncomplicated cough or cold. And for some people, this is some children, people <laughs> through their childhood, you know how they get when they used to go to school, <laughs> they used to get, you know, coughs and colds come home with them as their immune system developed. And um, this is really the first remedy to think of um, if it isn't a big bad illness that needs aconite. It's also a specific for um, snap, crackle and popping in the ears after a cold or deafness after a cold where mucus gets stuck in the eustachian tubes and you know it, just a couple of days worth would usually do the trick. Magfoss should be in everybody's purse really. This is we call it affectionately the homeopathic aspirin. It's for any kind of pains really but especially cramping pains that are much better for heat and much better for firm pressure. So think menstrual pains, you know, cramps where you're in, on the bed wrapped around a hot water bottle tight against the tummy, tighter the better, the hotter the better. And those two symptoms, you, you pretty much have to have those two symptoms for MAGFOS to work. Children of any age with earache, sore throat, better for heat, better for wrapping it up. Colic, the babies, you know, you're holding them by their tummy. They calm down when you put a hot hand, you know, press it against their colicky tummies and so on. It's a cute little healing, you know, piece of magic to have a bottle of in your cabinet. So selecting a remedy. If you choose one symptom, your results cannot be guaranteed. You know, you need, I use this analogy, it's kind of, it's kind of cute, but it works. You want three legs for your stool to stand up nice and sturdy. And you can have a strong symptom, a physical symptom, a general symptom, the onset, was it slow or fast? You know, is that... It, it has to be remarkable. Have you got an emotional state, you know, sad, irritable, anxious, scared of dying? You need at least two leg, legs to be certain that your remedy will stand up. Three to be certain, certain. So that's just as you're going through the process of selecting a remedy, remember the legs. How many legs have you got? <laughs> Make a little note. <laughs> so here's my dosage guidelines. If you're new to homeopathy, start low. Um, be a little cautious with 30C or higher because the higher potencies tend to work faster. And if it's not the right remedy, they can sometimes you know, in theory, they shouldn't do anything. The wrong remedy shouldn't do anything. But sometimes it, you know, um, very occasionally people are sensitive to a remedy and that they don't feel great after it. I mean, it doesn't last. That goes away when you stop it. So there's no harm, no lasting harm. But it's good to get familiar with the low potencies first. Repeat according to the severity of the symptom. So you can give every half to one hour or uh, if it's very, very severe. I mean, um, terrible pains or like my son septicemia, you can give every five minutes. You can five, 10, 15 minutes. Um, less severe, less often. And if you're giving a tonic, um, like um, Califosforicum, if you're giving this as a tonic, give it two, three times a day for 
a few days, up to a week, really. Um, same with Kalimia. If you're giving it for a mild cold. So remember that your remedies, these remedies are catalysts for healing. They're not getting rid of symptoms, repeat after me. <laughs> so you're going to back off on improvement. That means take or give a remedy less often if there are any signs of improvement, just go like this. Oh, that's good, well done. Let's see how long that lasts. And stop altogether on significant improvement. So then you can do the dance, repeat as needed, stopping and starting until people are all better. But you're not going to repeat a remedy that didn't work. If you, if you give a remedy, it works well, same symptoms return, repeat the same remedy. I do suggest people make a relationship with remedies. They sort of say, do I, you know, and encourage your children to do the same. Do you need help getting better or can you do it yourself? That is something that's very nice to encourage the idea, or to plant the seed of the idea that people, little people, children, people can heal themselves. That's all we're doing with the homeopathy. So if you've given or taken six to 10 doses with no result and people are sick, I mean, especially small children, especially infants, then get help, but don't, you know, ideally you've gotten a diagnosis and you know this is something that's self-limiting to start with, not serious, you can tackle it. Um, in the US, um, the uh, um, Academy of Homeopathic Education have formed a, um, you know, a whole team of homeopaths, practitioners, students, graduates who are providing all kinds of acute services here. I think they're um, providing it to the Canadians. I don't know what you've got in Canada to um, get help at the weekend, out of office hours, for example, you know, um, for an acute illness for a child. That's what homeopaths need to provide to be um, helpful in their communities. Um, and you just have to know that there are many remedies for every complaint. We've got hundreds of cough remedies hundreds of colds, rem earache remedies. I mean, coughs are the worst. And, um, you know, just keep asking yourself, is there a bigger picture here that you're not taking into account? I had a mother call me, um, some of you, I, I apologize for those of you who've heard this sto story before, but the mother who, um, she, with her eight month old, who was teething, and badly, she wanted to give the baby chamomilla. And, um, but it didn't help in several potencies, it didn't help. Mother was really keen because the baby wanted to be carried all the time and was screaming in pain and had red cheeks or one red cheek. And she'd taken the baby to the doctor and doctor could find nothing wrong no ear infections, no abdominal, nothing, nothing else wrong with her whatsoever, no fever, nothing, nothing, nothing. A mother wanted to give a nice high potency of chamomilla, but the problem was there were no turrets in the gums. You know, you get turrets in the gums, there was no drooling, there were no symptoms of teething. And this came on very suddenly. One day she was fine in the morning and by that night she was screaming. So it was just off. The whole story was off and I interrogated the mother, let me interrogate her. I made her replay the video because it had been a week now, replay the video of the day the baby started screaming. And, um, you know, just starting right from the beginning, when they got up, what she wore, just, you know, every detail. Did she get dressed before going downstairs to make breakfast? And then what happened? 
then what happened and then what happened i mean 20 minutes we were talking trying talking 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 because she she did a really great job and then finally she said the words oh my god oh my god what oh my god then that's when the older child um brought the baby downstairs for her breakfast or lunch or whatever and um she fell who fell the the child fell she said she fell and then what happened well then i gave the baby arnica i mean there was nothing wrong with her that i could see gave the baby arnica and then what happened and then the baby woke up two hours later screaming and had not stopped since now this was so I know the baby's uh, in pain. And so I know what happened on the stairs and I, I make a deal, a cast iron deal with the mother. She has to go and question her child, the four year old and promise, cross her heart, hope to die, promise that she will not yell at the child if I'm right. I was right, she dropped her. She only dropped her down three or four stairs. It wasn't that far. <laughs> Remember I said, all oh, babies get dropped. This was this baby's drop on the head. And she cracked her head on the corner of, you know, some wall. And um, the mother gave Annika before the swelling came up and she didn't write it down. So she forgot. And she destroyed the evidence. Annika works so brilliantly if you don't wait until the bruise and swelling come out before giving Annika, it'll never come out. So now I know the baby's got a headache after a head injury and the remedy is natrium sulfuricum. And that, kept, that story is in your resource um, because here's my rule, make a note of every single remedy you give or to every single one, every stupid little arnica you give, just write it down, the date, the person, just in case, at the very least, you know, just their name, the date and the remedy. Because you never know, it may be a flu that you give a really good remedy to someone and you had to work quite hard for it. And the next year or two years later, they have really similar symptoms. You will not remember unless you've got one of those, you know, special memories. Most of us don't, you know, you won't remember what it was. And that's a shame. You have to do all that work all over again. So the baby who screamed for nearly a week, that's the story. And, um, Prescribing on babies, always seek professional help for chronic complaints. You're not going to try and cure them of anything. You're just with a light touch, getting familiar with homeopathic, home prescribing that's within your scope. So um, if the baby or the child has a homeopath already, you have to check with them first to make sure that you can give a remedy for a cold or an earache or an injury that it won't have a bad effect with the constitutional remedy that they've been given. And, you know, keep your remedies out of reach, because not because they're dangerous, but because they're in sucrose. So if a child, the minute I have had children do one of two things in families, when they find out where the kits are, the children who aren't allowed sugar, aren't allowed to eat sugar, the parents don't, you know, allow it for whatever reason, they will go to the kit and they will um, just every day have a few, you know, have a quarter or a half a tube and the next day and until they've eaten the whole kit some the younger children the wilder children will just eat the whole lot in one go and that that's expensive <laughs> that's all no harm will come to them but it's just your bank balance will suffer so i'm going to now show you here's um a typical remedy with the 
I think you can see those, the little pellules in here. Um, this is Arnica 30C. And um, you can tell a homeopathic child because <laughs> um, the best place, the best way to give a remedy is just to throw the tablet, the, the little pellules under the tongue. And so children who are used to this procedure, they go, ah, <laughs> you, know, ah. <laughs> you know, so you can just throw them under the tongue. If you're not very good, you don't want the lid to touch the lips, then you can always put the pellules into a, a spoon first and then they don't have to go under the tongue, they can just suck on them. Or for little babies, you can crush them between two spoons and then put the powder, or you don't have to crush them. You can just put the pillules into a little glass of water like this, give it a really good stir. They don't have to dissolve. Um, and then just give teaspoon doses from the water. That's kind of nice. That keeps, you know, your, your kit will last a lovely long time if you do it that way. People, the most frequently asked question by new people who are new to homeopathy is, how many pellules? Did you see me count them? No, you didn't. It doesn't matter. One, three, five, six. I mean, it really doesn't matter. And these little guys, the little from the very small kits, the, um, the half dram, these are tiny little poppy seed pellets. And there are, I don't know if you can see these, but there are literally, there are <coughs> over a thousand of these in these little half dram tubes. I counted them because I didn't believe the pharmacy. <laughs> so, um, they will they'll last forever you can will them to your children or grandchildren literally um so these are my articles here's some good introductory books this one the first edition is free online it's short it's a brilliant explanation of homeopathy and it's even not actually laugh out loud i sniggered <laughs> did I sniggered reading it. Um, any book by Dorothy Shepherd, she was a British GP, an inner London doctor who was had a 100% homeopathic practice. And all her books are brilliant. You learn so much. She tells brilliant, entertaining stories. Um, and the companion book to mine that's very helpful is, um, is the Panos and Heimlich book that um, it's a very nice cross-reference to my handbook, which of course is not complete, nothing is. Um, and there are some links, my creams in Canada. You have a homeopathic resource in Vancouver, um, Jackson's Natural Cell, um, the cell salts, they sell a very nice and they sell homeopathic kits and um, they're just very lovely people and they sell some of my products too. And I think, Robin, have we got any other questions? We have a few, if we can indulge you, would that be okay? Yeah, I'm all Excellent. yours. Let me come join you so that you're not all alone. There you go. Thank you. First of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks to Homeo for Homeopathy Canada. You got it. It's the same as the Brit. We're, we're sisters, brothers, sisters. Yes, exactly. How brilliant. Um, yeah, so a few questions for you. Um, this is from Alex. Hi, Alex. Um, she wants to know how long do we have to wait before giving a remedy for colds and flus? Like, do you wait 24 hours to get really clear symptoms or can you? Excellent, give excellent question. Here's the, um, uh, it's, it's not simple, the answer. So one, if someone's suffering, you don't wait. They've got very strong, clear symptoms, you don't wait. If they're not coping, you don't wait. If they're not too bad, they're not too bad and they've just got a cold and you can't really see any 
clear symptoms, you haven't got a clear picture, probably a good idea to wait. So that's the common sense part of it. If you don't want to wait, <laughs> if you're not a waiting kind of person, some people are not good at it. They won't stand in line. You know, they will, they will come back later. Um, then give calimia. If it's a cold, you can always give a cell salt. That's what they're there for. They're the supplements of the homeopathic world. You can, you know, give a few doses. Now, having said that, here's the problem. If you give a little remedy, and it does a lot of good, but your child doesn't actually get better. They link, they not malinger, their symptoms linger on for a few days, and they clearly need something, but you don't know what. Then giving them a little cell salt may be not so smart, because it what we we say is it knocks off a few symptoms. So now it doesn't, that illness doesn't have a chance to develop more fully and give you a good picture. You, it's, I'll tell you what it's like. A homeopathic remedy heals like, it's like throwing a pebble into a pond. My job, your job is to get that pebble to land at as close to the middle of the pond as possible, because all it does is go plop. It's the ripples it sends out that do the healing. When you, when that pebble lands in the middle of the pond, it sends healing ripples out to the whole pond, to the whole person, as it were. A little remedy that's close, not so close, a little bit, you know, you're just shooting from the hip. It can land on the edge of the pond and, you know, just address an area, you know, one area. So maybe Calimio gets rid of the runny nose, but now they've got a cough. That's, that wasn't good. That was that it's gone a little bit deeper. It shouldn't do that. You don't want that to happen. The disease goes, you know, more, becomes a little bit more serious. You want, so if it's not too bad and you're not good at waiting, just give yourself a talking to, you take something. <laughs> I never thought of saying that before. Oh, it's so often when you deal with children, it's the parents who need the remedy, not the well, child. Sometimes, not always. <laughs> no, 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 but it's happened. It's happened. Yeah. Okay, fabulous. I'm going to combine two questions into one because it has to do with Arnica. Um, and uh, one is from Julie and one is from Aaron. So Julie wanted to know about Arnica or, or, or Hypericum around surgery. So ar the concept of Arnica around surgery. And, yeah. and Aaron wanted to know, she says, I'd like to hear a little bit more about not giving Arnica too soon. I often give it right away. And now I'm understanding that it might actually be detrimental to healing. So I think the two are dovetailing those questions. No, no, I hear you. Oh, they are. Let me answer the second one first. No, you can't give it too soon if you know what the injury is. Actually, that's a clever question. Um, I hear what you're saying. You want to know what the injury is. If it hasn't manifested, then don't give anything. You know, <laughs> you know, um, nothing. I mean, Give rescue remedy. Do you know what that is in this in Canada? You do. If someone has hurt themselves and they're a bit shocked, but they're not, you don't have any clearly identifiable symptoms, then give rescue remedy. Wait. It's another wait and see, isn't it? Just to be sure, um, certain what you're dealing with. Um, I mean, if you shoot from the hip, with Arnica and you don't write it down, you run the risk of, I mean, it's very unusual what happened to this baby, but I have to tell you this, that how many times do we practitioners see patients where something happened in their childhood 
or young adulthood or babyhood or whenever something happened because there's a timeline and they have forgotten they don't know that piece of information is lost in time i mean had that baby couldn't say my head hurts you idiots <laughs> Couldn't say it, was eight months old, wasn't going to talk for another year and a half, was a late talker. She couldn't say that. Most people don't remember their babyhoods. And then we get to make stuff up and project all sorts of things onto them. But information that's lost in time is very difficult to recover. And had I not interrogated that mother on a Sunday morning at 7 a.m., which is when she called me, to say she'd been up all night with the baby. And if I didn't let her give the baby a high potency of chamomilla, she was going to fire me. <laughs> if I hadn't done that, she probably would never have remembered it. So um, had we not uncovered that, that child would have had headaches, chronic headaches for her whole life. And we wouldn't have known why. And she could have had all kinds of other complaints. So yeah, maybe wait and see. Yeah, I'm revising my answer. <laughs> so what was the first question? I've forgotten it now. Just the use of Arnica and Hyperion. Oh, hospital, yes. Around, so around surgery, you know, and bleeding with Arnica and stuff, you know. I've got a surgical protocol. Do you, I'll include it, shall I? Well, it sounds like we're getting a handout. Of, normally we don't, but this would be a tremendous treat. That would be amazing. Oh, you always get a handout from me. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to teach you how to. <laughs> no, I, 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 always, I always give my slides in a PDF. So I'll include it. You know, so mm -hmm. the surgical, pro I don't believe in giving Arnica before. I, give, I, I will give um, aconite before if people are scared of the surgery because they need to go in not scared. Aconite is, they're scared of dying, which of course is what really happened. Uh, you know, there's a little, you, you, you're unconscious, you know. You want to be unconscious, it's good, but <laughs> you know, you're you're scared that you so aconite is brilliant before surgery when people are fit scared afterwards depending on where and what the surgery is different remedy arnica is never a bad thing never it's always fine to give some arnica afterwards um but if the surgery is abdominal then it's different remedies if the surgery is the spine could be hypericum if the surgery if it's plastic surgery and people you know are very unhappy it's different remedies you know if they're happy it's plastic surgery is usually i i give calendula a lot because it's you know epithelial tissue um maybe a little bit of arnica of the swelling but calendula is the main remedy to help all those um tissues you know if it's bone, then, you know, they've had a nose reconstructed or what have you, then it's, you want to know what the tissues are and um, what the whole picture is. <laughs> the whole picture. So you want two or three legs to, you know, to select a good remedy. Otherwise you're guessing. Oh, Aaron said, so well answered. That made so much sense. Thank you. Yeah. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you no, know, when Miranda's I'm, talking about... Oh, so go ahead. I'm bowing. Yeah, I, I did a little <laughs> curtsy. <laughs> Thank you. But it's, good, it's a good time to reinforce that when Miranda's talking about you want to look at the emotionals. You want to look at what we call generals. So, you know, whether they're chilly or whether they're better from lying or this or that. Remember, all of those slides that she's given you, most of them, even though it might be for fever or it might be for, you know, this or that, she's giving you a lot of what's called general symptoms. And you can apply that if you have another kind of affliction 
you can be looking for those, what we call generals, thermals and mood and yep. aversion yep. for food and stuff like that. And you can apply it because it matches that remedy. It will match your disease as well. They can, I over, they can overrule. I remember the first um, patient with a fracture who needed bryonia. Not symphytum did absolutely nothing. They, you know, they were, I forget, an acupuncturist maybe who'd been taking it for a week or two was still in a lot of pain, but their limb was worse for the slightest movement and they were very irritable. Boom, you know, brain. Brain. So it you know, over even though it is it, it it will help injured joints, but it's not a huge fracture remedy. It's there. It's it, but those general symptoms overrule the physical always if they're very marked. I remember you telling us that you used apis for your some was it a fracture or a, was that the cut on the toe or something just because at some point for the, the a skin fracture, very for a fracture in a patient okay. a friend who had a fractured wrist and symphytum did absolutely nothing now the keynotes for apis are that they have stinging burning pains that you know it's um it's a uh, anaphylaxis remedy it's a remedy for burns it's a remedy for bites and stings and all kinds of funky things but they're uh, and also allergies <laughs> they have burning pains stinging pains that are um worse heat and better cold so this the the wrist wasn't cast it was in a brace and this, the friend would rip the brace off because it got hot. So it burns and it stings. I mean, they use those words, you know, it's a, and put it into cold, cold water, get an ice pack. <gasps> That's better. That's so much better. It was swollen and the swelling was a peculiar rosy red color. I mean, honestly, Apis within just one dose, pain gone. So most of our remedies do not fall dead central. They fall off center and that's fine. That's fine. No harm, no shame in that. But when a remedy <laughs> falls dead center and does that beautiful rippling out to the whole person and you feel it because it's you know, your remedy or you see it in someone else. It's kind of nice. It's magic. That's what Dorothy Shepherd's talking about. Magic of the minimum. And it's, it's a perfect reminder that don't go for one remedy for one disease or one affliction, because look at those generals. In this case, the burning, even yeah. though APIS is not. So this segues into one. I have two more questions if we can indulge you. Okay. Um, Linda asks, what if your flu fits gelsemium? So it, we're talking yeah. about now flexibility and thinking when it comes to prescribing. Yeah. What if the flu fits gelsemium symptoms, but the person is sweating profusely and switches to chills and sweats? Can it still be indicated? What do you do when your patient responds, let's say, to one remedy and then starts bringing up new symptoms? If a remedy, uh, whoa, that would be healing. The sweating is a good thing with a fever, isn't it? So um, I would just stick with it. I mean, I would wait. I would let them sweat it out now. If, you know, one remedy, it's a good question in that one remedy isn't, you know, one patient isn't going to manifest every symptom. That's kind of annoying, but people do not do that. You're always making a choice. You're always differentiating between two similar remedies. And the way you do that is take the strongest, most striking, most unusual symptoms and those, the hierarchy, that those go at the top of your pyramid, if you like. Those, if you've given a remedy that works, that's worked very well across the board, and now someone is sweating where they weren't before, I mean, sweating helps a fever. People shouldn't be dry with a fever. That is a special kind of torture. Sweating 
helps to bring the fever down naturally. So you, that I would see that as a positive response. And because the remedy worked, I would stick with it if it needed repeating. So that's a rule. You don't change a remedy that works. <laughs> the, that we've gone into advanced time prescribing. <laughs> Thank you. And our last question, and this is a little bit beyond the scope of this class because we could do a whole one on dentistry alone, but do you have any quick and dirties for dental surgery before, during, and after from Uma wants to know? Oh man. The simple answer is no, but the the physiology of, you know, I've sort of touched on this, the phys, um, physiology, anatomy and physiology of teeth is very interesting. They're not solid, you know, they're porous and they're not, you know, they're not drilled into your jawbone. They, they hang in there, they're by um, a, a sort of lattice work if you like of ligaments so ligament you know that that's how come they get to move ever so slightly that's why braces work because those ligaments are um you know um and and there are other tissues that carry nerves and carry blood supply there's so much going on underneath and then the susceptibility you know, your inherited weaknesses show up in your teeth very strongly. So dental surgery is way complex. And um, hypericum is, of course, a very strong remedy to think of because anytime they start cutting around in here, you get a ton of pain. It's usually nerve pain. But you need... Um, it's too complex. It's too variable. I, I, I have had, home, you know, homeopaths tip, typically say, yeah, just give Arnica after for the swelling. Um, but I've had that backfire and not work. And um, worse, the time has passed and now the symptoms are, are now more severe. Staphysagria is a this is a sort of very, uh, what's the word? Mm, the mouth full of nerves, full of, you know, this is, we're sensitive in this area emotionally, aren't we? Um, so staphysagria, which is the one remedy after surgery of any kind where people feel beaten up. Why did they have to do it like that? They didn't have to cut my jaw. They didn't have to cut in so you know far and they and the nurse this and the dentist that and I'm so upset that's how people get that's the, the, isn't it that's the voice they use that's and now everything's so I can't even touch I can't eat everything's so sensitive it's like you know this is not hypericum <laughs> this is something this is a bigger picture now so you're listening, you're listening to hear what does this person need? It's not simple, but thank you. <laughs> it's a, yeah, and you know what? And this is a great idea, guys. We should actually do a webinar on dental stuff. So oh, get a dentist, a homeopathic dentist to give that one. That's a brilliant idea. We have a great one here in Toronto. So oh, I know fine. exactly. Perfect. So I look forward to it. Uh, Miranda, if I can indulge you to go on to the next slide. Yes. So thank you, first of all, from me, Robin. Thank you for this lovely opportunity. Thanks to all of you who came. And um, I wish you many great remedies. I you wish you every success with your home prescribing. OK. Well, needless to say, I, I can't even keep up. Thank you for the great presentation. Thank you for the generosity. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Miranda. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, okay, <laughs> I'll, send, I'll send you the transcript so you can put it up on your bathroom wall and feel good. <laughs> so um, we have taken advantage of Miranda's generosity and willingness to come talk before H Canada to use her book.
which she put up very briefly, but I'll put up a nice picture of. This is Homeopathy for Pregnancy, Birth, and Your Baby's First Year. And this will be our first book that we're going to be covering in our newly launched book club that I will be doing with my beautiful colleague, Nicole Duelli from For Homeopathy Canada. Um, it is the series available without charge if you are a member. Membership is all of $10 a month for a year. But if you wow. don't want to join, but want to come to the individual sessions, we will charge you $15 a donation per session. We would appreciate that. Uh, we will be covering Miranda's book in what I like to call trimesters. So we will do before birth, during, you know, the birth process and then after baby is born. And uh, we would love to have you come. It's going to be in a meeting style. So it won't be like this, won't be Weber style. Your picture will be able to be up if you choose to. You don't have to. Uh, we know everybody's at home with COVID and not necessarily uh, getting dressed every day. That's fine. Uh, but we would we would have your uh, microphones open and we would love to have a discussion with you. Nicole and I will provide structure and we'll provide some slides, but it's really all about you bringing in your experiences and questions and what your impressions of the book are. So before each class, we'll send you out what we're going to cover. You can read that in the book. It's very, very easy, beautiful reading. Miranda is not just a homeopath and an iridologist and a healer and a but she's also a wonderful, wonderful writer. And uh, as much as you enjoyed her talking, that's how this book is like. It's like she's talking to you in your in your living room while you're curled up with her. Here's what happened. Here's how that happened. I never wrote a thing before I wrote my book, this book. This is the first thing I ever wrote. I told the publishers, I don't know how to write. <laughs> I know how to speak but you have to help me write like I speak. I don't want to write a dry nonfiction book that pe puts people to sleep. I want to, so it makes my heart feel so happy to hear you say that. Thank you. It's absolutely, it's honestly, you can't put it down because it's just so informative and, I just, I'm just, I just refer to it constantly. You don't know this, Miranda, but in my neighborhood, there is a, a population where there's a lot of births and I've been slowly, slowly training myself to be able to feel confident to, you know, take them on as clients. And your book has been a tremendous three-legged stool, maybe a seven-legged stool. <laughs> <laughs> cute. All right, so we hope to see everybody at for, uh, at the book club. You need to sign up to, to join. Please go to forhomeopathycanada.org in order to sign up. And if we can go to the next slide, we're just going to wrap this up. So you can uh, follow us on all different social media. We would love to get testimonials from you. This is really good, our bread and butter to get testimonials. We want to bring homeopathy to the world and to get people to... Uh, see that uh, it's worth um, practicing, it's worth uh, using at home. And uh, if it comes from people like you, it's obviously those of us who have studied it, you know, according to some people, we've drunk the Kool-Aid, but we also know that it works. And, but we've invested so much time. We don't have the same um, gravitas that you do home users who say, you know, I used it and I, it was just like, I can't believe it. My, my daughter went from this to this and like, five seconds, you know, or I had a long-term issue in it and it went away slow and slowly with good progress, it went away. So we would love to hear from you. And the last slide is just our usual disclaimer. Um, and uh, I think there's one more. Miranda? Yeah, perfect. Uh, so we encourage you to become members of uh, 4-H Canada. It's a uh, uh, it's not too expensive, we hope. We hope we're doing, you know, some very good work. Uh, as you saw in the, see what's going on in the States, you might be getting emails about supporting homeopathy in the States because there is great threat to its existence. We don't want the same thing to happen to us here in Canada. So if we can, um, you know, just like homeopathy can nip something in the bud before it develops into something bigger, let's try to nip the descent, to, oh good, to homeopathy in Canada before it becomes a thing. And that's where you come in. So I think we're gonna end this session with the lovely 18 year old. What is the name of your cat? Alice. This is Alice. a little higher because your name is covering her. Oh, my my name? What is covering? Na the name yeah, is covering Alice's face. The name on your, uh, there we go. <gasps> oh. Little Alice. Uh, she's, <laughs> she was an alley cat, you know, she was, 
we had her for, since she was six weeks old. So you've had her a very, and she's moved with you then to several states, yes. I guess. <laughs> She's beautiful. Um, so, and, and we've had two classes on um, veterinary homeopathy, Miranda. So uh, you can- Oh, uh, can excellent. With so Richard Pitkin it, and- Here's my, uh, my best Alice story. Recently, she has a, she's had some kidney stuff and, um, you know, I just took her to the vet for some blood work and it wasn't so bad. Anyway, I said, oh, what remedy, you know, because- like she's hardly ever sick, and I, and I said, hang on a sec. She wants ice water. You know, she wants cold water. If you put ice in it, she's there, you know, like crazy. And she will come out of a deep sleep in another room to eat vanilla ice cream out of the bowl as you try and she will put her head in the bowl to eat it as you're eating. So I gave her phosphorus. She's bigger. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and she's been more affectionate since she got sick. So that was, you know. Anyway. Oh, very well. You know, and I remember. Uh, I think it was Kim Lee. I said in one of his lectures, or. or you know, the one thing with homeopathy is that it will not change who you are fundamentally as a person. So did she go back to being less affectionate? No, I, her... no, no. Yeah, no, she didn't. But um, she's, that has stayed. I mean, she, she got less thirsty because that was pathological because the kidneys, she, she was drinking like a crazy cat too much. So that was good. Fantastic. Well, we and wish it, Alice well. We wish you well. Um, and stay safe, everybody. Yeah. And good luck with Thanksgiving in the States. And for us in Canada, we've had it and we're reaping the benefits of what we sowed with uh, maybe too many uh, people cl in close quarters. So hopefully you guys stay safe in the States. Um, thank yeah. you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Miranda. Thanks, and Robin. It's been a pleasure. Um, good luck to you, too. Our next uh, class will be our, our um, book club and we hope to all see you there. I'm gonna say bye for now. Take care, everybody. Ciao, au revoir. <laughs> <There you go. laughs>